and welcome to the show. Yes, David and Mel, welcome to the show. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. A pleasure. We have a couple of just basic questions. Hey, and we can start with David. What is it that you do? And then Melvin, what is it that you do? And then how is it that you guys are working together? Yeah. So my background is I'm about as close to being an American as you can be without having the big eagle passport. I grew up in a border city, Windsor. My father would wake up in Canada and go and work in the United States every day. What was quite common back then, it's only you know a mile across the river, is when mothers would feel contractions, they'd run over to Henry Ford Hospital to have what they now call anchor babies. My parents were incompatible, blood incompatible. It doesn't affect the first two children, but by the time they got to me, number three, then my younger sister, number four, when she got pregnant with me, the doctor said, don't be driving across the bridge. That kid's going to need blood transfusions. You have them in Canada. Mm -hmm. So literally the only reason I don't have an American passport is because of my parents had incompatible blood. So I grew up going through law school, never thinking I was going to do it. It was just a great gig. I worked for Canada Customs at the Woods of Detroit Tunnel and then immigration. And then in 1990, I saw the light or got called to the dark side and, and was called to the bar. And at that point, I did kind of three major events happen. One is my law school study partner went and worked for a big American firm called Baker McKenzie in Hong Kong. It was prior to the 97 handover. So I've been dealing with, with Hong Kong, China, Asia clients for three decades. Canada mm -hmm. back then had what they now call a golden visa program, a residence by investment program. And I was running up and down the Gulf kind of before, during and after the Gulf War meeting private banking clients for HSBC and Standard Charter. And having grown up kind of with Canada and U.S. tax at the breakfast table, I did my first U.S. expatriation because the U.S. has this unique citizenship-based taxation. And so over the 30 years, those are my main groups. But, you know, the power goes out in South Africa. I have South African clients. Mexicans elect AMLO. I have Mexican clients. France brings in a wealth tax. I have Wealth clients. I've lived in the UK on a tax favorable basis, something called a non DOM. I currently am in Poland, and how I end up in Poland was, as oftentimes it happens in life, a woman was involved who fell asleep on me in an airplane. And fast forward, we'll celebrate our 12th anniversary. And tomorrow we're having the ninth birthday party for our twins. Congratulations. That's my background. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mel. And my background is that after law school, I decided I wanted to come to Washington and my desire was to work for the U.S. Internal Revenue Service. So mm -hmm. I went to work as a young lawyer in the Office of General Counsel of the IRS National Office, which is the main office of the Internal Revenue Service. And at night, I would walk over about four or five blocks to Georgetown University Law Center where I was in the master's of tax program. And one of the law professors there, his wife happened to be a Supreme Court justice. Marty Ginsburg was a very well-known, highly regarded corporate tax lawyer and professor. And then after that, I went back to Boston where I'm from, met my wife and I worked in a 100 person law firm. And then I was recruited to open up the Boston office private client practice a very large, well-known international law firm, McDermott, Will & Emery, that today is on two different continents. I, after being there for about eight years and getting exposed to international tax matters, I moved on to J.P. Morgan Private Bank and, again, worked extensively with foreign clients and these types of issues. After that, I came to the realization a few years ago that I'd rather be on my own. I worked in some very large law firms, banks, and uh, the U.S. Internal Revenue Service. So today, I just work out of my home offices, and my value proposition for my clients is they can always reach me. I have no overhead. I have no employees. I do all the work myself, and they pay about 50 or 60 percent of what I would have to charge if I was still a senior partner at a major international law firm. So that's my story. And in terms of how I met David, I'll share with you that 
exchange. So about four years ago, I was asked by an accountant to help with an expatriation. And when I asked the client to send me his balance sheet, I almost fell off my chair because he only had $600 million of worldwide appreciation. And we started down the road. I came up with some strategies how to mitigate his exit tax on two very, very large, and I mean three, $400 million positions. We took a blockage discount because he was about to expatriate and he'd have to file a Form 8854. This was during COVID, and the client kept insisting to me that he really was going to go for his formal renunciation appointment on April 26, 2021 in New Zealand. And I kept saying, how did you get an appointment? No one can get an appointment. And then that's how I was introduced to David, because David had secured for this client an expatriation renunciation appointment at the U.S. consulate in Auckland, New Zealand. After wow. that, David and I began to chat, and we realized that our practices were fairly complementary. I know a little bit about immigration law, but certainly not what David knows. And David certainly has contacts at the U.S. State Department and throughout the world in helping wealthy clients expatriate if that's what they wish to do. And moreover, David is quite knowledgeable about residency by investment, citizenship by investment, whereas my expertise is strictly on the tax side. Mm -hmm. I've had experience with clients leaving the U.S., coming to the U.S., buying real estate in the U.S. as a foreigner. And I have also had significant experience in remediation because too frequently people with some type of foreign connection don't realize they have to file FBARs or some of the other very onerous tax reporting. And so David and I complement each other in a big way. And we're talking four or five times a week. Wow. And, and, and one of the things, so I've dealt with a lot of U.S. tax lawyers over the 30 plus mm -hmm. years. Mel, I won't embarrass him, but he's been at it longer than <laughs> I have. But between us, between us, we have more than three quarters of a century of experience in this. There are a lot of excellent tax lawyers in the United States, but most of them deal only with domestic okay. issues. They're not used to kind of the international. And so yeah. when I started working, when I was introduced to Mel through this particular client, I kind of instantly recognized, ah, here's a unicorn. Mm -hmm. Here's somebody who knows, you know, it's certainly at the top of his game with regards to U.S. domestic, but also Americans investing abroad, foreigners investing okay. in the United States. And we also look at, at a variety of issues. We're, we're just now in the process of doing an article with re, or doing a series of articles with regards to the movement between Israel and the United mm -hmm. States. So mm -hmm. Jewish Americans who are worried about anti-Semitism, their first thought is Israel. At the same time, Israelis are, have their own domestic issues. They're thinking, okay, what's my backup plan from Israel, the United States? And so what are the issues kind of moving back and forth between those jurisdictions? I mentioned before Mexicans who are looking at what's my backup plan with the current government. And of course, Mexicans like Canadians, many of them went to school, own businesses, vacation homes, et cetera, with with the United States. So, you know, what are the issues between the two? And Mel is one of the few people who can really look at things like tax treaties, mm -hmm. et cetera. And so I like to say we, we may write the symphony together. He conducts the orchestra and I play first violin. Oh, wow. That's a great <laughs> illustration. Wow. What a duo, both of you, honestly, working with a whole bunch of, you know, immigrants that come in here. And I remember, you know, one of them wanted to become, you know, green card holder and regional centers. And I had to choose her an attorney that would advise her also in text. And I remember how hard it is to find somebody that knows, and she from Uzbekistan, how hard it was to find something. And she moved all of her money and she had millions because she had like a very successful oil refiner company in her country. And I remember the process. I wish I knew two of you, but back then you were not a duo, you were separate. So I'm so happy that our listeners can hear this. So go ahead, Nina. 
Uh, yeah, to the listeners, if you would just write down their name and their name. Yes. If put in your own of text, you never know when you will need it. Hey guys, before we get into the really nitty of, of this topic, it seems to me that we have become a very globalized world. It seems that it's so easy to go from country to country. Technology allows communication from languages to other languages, from cultures across the across the globe. And now economics are seem to be just blending together. What are your thoughts on globalization, if you don't mind me asking? Well, let me make the first comment, and David alluded to this. In my area, the U.S. is exceptional mm -hmm. and unique because unlike virtually any other industrialized nation, the United States imposes its income tax and its estate tax on citizens wherever they live and also on residents such as green card holders. And so it is, it is rather unique in that respect because of the fact that it can span the entire globe. Mm. In terms of the world itself becoming smaller, that's true. However, one of my cardinal rules is that whenever I'm dealing with a client from another country, I'm not admitted to practice law there and we always have to get a local lawyer or an accountant there. And I have a pretty good Rolodex Sometimes I ask David for his input for lawyers who might be in Canada, the UK, Israel, India, Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, mm -hmm. or wherever, because I'm not admitted to practice there. And each country has its own separate requirements. And in addition, countries such as China and India have currency control, which limits mm -hmm. the amount of cash that can be withdrawn. And it's one of the things also to emphasize, both Mel and I, one of the, the things you, you learn when you become a new lawyer is, who is your client? And our clients are the individuals or the families that, that we're working on behalf of. And too many people in the space I deal with, which is getting and getting rid of, of residences and citizenships and domiciles, they're commission-driven salespeople. They don't care if this is the right solution okay. for the client. They don't look at tax issues, et cetera. And they're very used to, we started actually co-authoring a, a column called American Exceptionalism because for a lot of the people in this space, they were used to selling in China. And now all of a sudden they're selling to the United States and they don't realize it's a completely different market, mm -hmm. completely different taxes, completely different securities laws, et cetera. And not only from the customer's point of view, but from also the product suppliers. But we're very agnostic with regards to jurisdictions. We don't, and if we've talked, mentioned about citizenship and residence by investment, that's one way of getting citizenship. Mm -hmm. But the United States, Canada, the Americas, those are immigrant, those were immigrant destination countries in the, in the 19th and 20th century. So, you know, estimates of up to 35% of Americans may very well have claim to a lineage citizenship. Mm -hmm. And they say, well, you know, yes, I'm, my background is Italian or Belgian or whatever. And what, and I don't really want to move back there because it's cold or for whatever reason. But what they don't realize is that that, that citizenship gives them access, not just to that, the country of their ancestors, but to all 27 EU countries. Mm -hmm. And so it's, understanding kind of how all the different options are play. And then once we pull together the plan, then again, I'll use the orchestra. Who else do we need here? Well, we need local council, for example, in Spain, because there's a, a Spanish state ongoing, or we need, you know, lineage citizenship. So for example, in Poland, even though I'm in Poland, I retain local council. And so what we do is kind of the, the bigger plan and then we coordinate the other members of the orchestra to make sure that we have a sweet sound. Before we go, I'm sorry, Melvin, but we, before we go further down this path as well, who would be interested on searching counsel from you guys? What do, who is your customer? Why would we want to renounce citizenship in the U.S.? I would say that renunciation 
is a very serious step to take. Mm -hmm. And more often, what clients will do is they will come to David and say, I'd like to consider a second passport. So unlike India or unlike China, the U.S. and most of the rest of the world permits a second passport. The client through which I met David had purchased in 2015 a Maltese passport. This individual knew exactly what he wanted to do. He wanted to spend more time in Europe, and he knew that a Maltese passport would enable him to have access to all of Europe to live or to work. And so by the time this individual decided he wanted to expatriate and renounce his citizenship, he was all set to go. Sometimes there are situations where a client might think they wish to expatriate, but they don't even have a second passport yet. And so there's nothing that I can do other than some preparatory work and maybe some pre-expatriation planning, but it requires David's expertise to locate a suitable jurisdiction for that individual in order to have a second passport. And as David could explain to you, having a passport in one of the EU countries mm -hmm. is preferable because of the fact that those countries' passport holders are able to take advantage of the U.S. visa-free waiver program, whereas virtually all of the Caribbean countries, that's not necessarily the case. There's only 40 countries on the U.S. visa-free waiver program, and that's a big deal because it allows you to have free access back to the U.S. Sometimes that's important, sometimes it's not. And, and another reason, and again, this is a little bit of personal information, and I swear my siblings and I didn't go out nightclubbing looking <laughs> for Europeans to dance with, but my older sister married a Latvian, my brother married an Italian, mm -hmm. I married a Scotswoman, then a Pole, and my younger sister married an Irishman. Now, I'm the only one of the four wow. of us to actually pick up and move to Europe, but I can tell you all of my nieces and nephews have done everything from a gap year to study, etc. If you have a claim to that EU citizenship, not only do you have mobility rights to live or work, study work throughout, you also have investment rights. So some countries, for example, Switzerland, restrict ownership of certain properties to Swiss mm. or EU nationals. So if you are looking to invest or do business in yeah. Europe, that European passport, it may help your child to you know, do a gap year wandering through Europe, but it may also help you from a business point of view. Another advantage is, uh, you know, as people found out in, during the pandemic, is if you're not a member of the club, you may not be allowed in. So there was a, a case that got fairly famous. I got called in after fact, but it was a, a wealthy family, American family, that flew in with some German friends to Sardinia to spend the season. And they got off the plane and the Italian said, OK, Germans, you can come in. And the Americans, no, we're not letting in Americans right now. And they go, but we have a big <laughs> state here and we come here. Every, it doesn't matter. Thank you very much. Get back on your plane and fly home. And so for, for many people that is an expansion of their mobility rights. And an analogy that we're also using is no matter what country, you know, for Mexico, your, your wildfire okay. source may be AMLO. For China, it may be the central government. You don't want to be Jack Ma. If you live in a wildfire zone, what are the natural things you do? Well, you engage in fire prevention, and that may be domestic tax planning, doing gifting or grats or all those those normal things. It may be if you're worried about some violence or, or instability. It may be moving into a, to a different location, getting a dog, et cetera. But you also get, if you're in a fire wildfire zone, you also get fire insurance, which would be mm -hmm. for an American, a second resident, second citizenship. And you also get Mel and I to design a fire escape plan. Now, the wildfire may never come, but you've got, if it does, You've got the fire insurance and the fire escape plan. And what some people don't appreciate is the period of time that it sometimes takes to develop, and be, develop these things. So I had another client who said, well, okay, I can get a second citizenship. My grandmother was born in Ireland. I said, well, yes, you are entitled to it, but it's not like you dial 1-800-IM-IRISH and a leprechaun yeah. delivers the passport mm -hmm. to you. There's a process to go through. And of course, your application is going to be sitting in a desk 
behind everybody in the UK at, who, as a result of Brexit, also has an Irish parent or grandparent. And so you'll get it. It's just, will it be in time for that liquidity event or the sooner thing? So it's understanding all the different jurisdictions, all the different paths. And because both Mel and I are independent, mm -hmm. we're not getting paid by third parties. We're giving clients all of the pros, all the cons. And we also understand what are the nemo the negative ramifications. Does, does that country, for example, oh, I've got Dutch relatives. Yes, U.S. allows dual citizenship, but Holland does not. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm going to go to Singapore. Well, Singapore doesn't allow dual citizenship if you take out Singaporean citizenship. It has military service, not just mm -hmm. for, for male citizens, but for male residents of a certain age. So, you know, whether that's military service, currency mm -hmm. controls in India or China or South Africa, it's understanding all of these elements. And another element where this comes into play is, well, I have a bunch of factories and I can't pick them up and take them out. I can wire, I can change my brokerage account, but I can't take out that factory. And then understanding how investment treaties work and how residents and citizenship and domicile. So the more complicated people's lives are, the more is necessary to have. And that's why, you know, having met Mel, I think since that first client, when you finally meet another unicorn in the forest, you kind of mm -hmm. don't let them out of your sight. So, so let me let me give you a couple of other examples that build on what David just said. I have a uh, couple mm -hmm. who live in Singapore. They're both formerly U.S. citizens. When the husband expatriated, he was a covered expatriate, meaning mm -hmm. he had more than he had way more than two million dollars a year in uh, net uh, two million dollars of net worth, and the wife was not, she was just under it. And so therefore, when they moved to Singapore, they moved with their two US citizen children. Fast forward, couple's worth about $100 million today, but I had to restructure all of their original mm -hmm. expatriation planning because the husband could not be the donor, the grantor, settlor of mm -hmm. a trust that would benefit as U.S. citizen children because then there would be a 40% U.S. inheritance tax. Mm. Unfortunately, not a lot of people realize that, yes, the U.S. has an exit tax, but even more pernicious is the U.S. inheritance tax, and it's a tax imposed on the recipient, the recipient of the gift or the uh, bequest at death. And so in this particular situation, the strategy that I recommended, and we were still implementing the strategy, was to empty out a poorly designed and problematic trust and put that property, really two LLC interests, mm -hmm. into the name of the spouse, the wife, who is a Singapore resident, but most importantly, not a covered expatriate. So that when she goes and puts money into a trust for their U.S. citizen children, there's not going to be a problem. And we're making sure that the husband has nothing to do with the trust has nothing to do with the underlying LLC interests. Mm -hmm. But if I told you this is going to take three years to implement, that's what it is. Uh, another situation that David and I have been involved in, going back to his comment about backup plans, is that sometimes we see individuals who come to the U.S. and they never officially abandon their green card. And this was the topic of a couple of articles that David and I wrote last year about Rishi Sunak. Rishi Sunak is the Prime Minister of England, former Chancellor of the Exchequer. And as the story goes, and this is all public information, right before Rishi Sunak was to fly to the U.S. to meet the U.S. Secretary of the Treasury, some advisors said, Rishi, I think you need to give up your U.S. green card that you got when you got your MBA at Stanford 15 years ago. Why did he have a green card living in England for 15 years? I don't know. But a green card means that you're a permanent legal resident of the United States. Mm -hmm. And so David and I put together an article, which we could share with you, as to the hoops that Rishi may have had to go through to prevent a U.S. exit tax. We presume that Rishi and his much wealthier wife could easily afford the best accounting talent there is. And we assume that he went through all these steps to make sure that he was not a covered expatriate 
whenever he gave up his green card status or possibly even before then. Mina, I had an interesting experience the other day. I was showing properties to a family with two kids and we had 10 to see. After viewing about half, the family was getting pretty hungry and they really just wanted to continue the other day. So what did you do? I went to my car and pulled out a bag of delicious Ricky Jerky. They loved it so much they were able to continue our day without any issues. All their ingredients are 100% natural, plus every strip is seasoned, marinated, and smoked by hand to give you the best experience and slap you back into the gear. But I need to buy some more. Oh, just head over to rickysjerky.com and use the discount code we call REI for 15% off your first order. So whether you're a busy real estate agent or just looking for mouth-watering snack on the go, Ricky Jerky got you covered. Yeah, I read that article. Very interesting article, actually. So, yes. One question I got to ask David. What is mm-hmm. backup plan? Because a lot you talked about a lot in your podcast and everything. And I'm sure, I mean, like we have an idea, but can you define us? What does it mean? Sure. What it is, it's, it's the ultimate goal of the plan is to protect family wealth and well-being. And well-being may mm-hmm. be... I don't want to disappear. I don't want to be a victim of a regime, et cetera. I want to move my family. One of the big reasons we're now getting for a lot of clients, no matter what their, their political stripe is, that they are parents or grandparents. And they say, statistically, I know my child or my grandchild is not going to be a victim of a mass shooting event, but I know with 100% certainty they're going to go through active shooter drills. And I just mm-hmm. don't want that stress every time I turn on the TV and see, you know, a helicopter shot of a school, I just don't need that. So I'm going to temporarily move out of the United States and, and look at. So that would be protecting their well-being. Protecting the wealth is as, as we've been talking. So when you look at a backup plan, an element of that would be that fire insurance of a second citizenship or second residence that I talked about. And it's not only for protective, it's got the positive ends too that I was talking about with regards to the Les Brown's niece and nephews are investing in, in other places. But it's also the integration with the, a tax-efficient fire escape plan. You want to make sure that that's not only tax-efficient, but that you've dotted every I and crossed every T. So that example of, that Mel had was somebody who had a fire escape plan and going to Singapore, but they didn't execute it properly. And so mm-hmm. a failure to do that is, you know, our fees are going to be a slight rounding error compared to, you know, <laughs> failure to do it properly. And so the backup plan is really looking at, first off, what are the, the concerns? What are the wildfire concerns of the family towards their wealth and well-being? And then what are the integrated solutions for resident citizenship and domicile with tax planning, with family law planning? I mean, my precocious little... Uh, Nine-year-old twins, a boy and a girl, you know, statistically, one of them is going to get divorced. And not that the Les Browns family treasure chest is so big, but <laughs> if they were to move to the UK, well, that's a very tax-favorable jurisdiction, but it's also the divorce capital of the world. Tax is a percentage of income. Divorce, that's a percentage of capital. And it's not a black swan event. And so my daughter's a pretty smooth talker, but she probably doesn't want to, you know, just before she's going to have a a marriage, try to call it, tell her, her, her to be troth, you know, we've got to go in and find a prenuptial agreement, be much better to, if the marriage falls apart, to be able to go, you know, honey, I'd love to give you half. It's those parents of mine, they set it all up into a trust when I was 10 years old. And so <laughs> it's looking at those types of threats to family wealth and well-being and where they come from, from government confiscation to changing rules to tax the rich policies, to authoritarian governments. And and you may have been, I've got a lot of Sudanese clients from the Middle East who left the Sudan when they were kids, who are now in their 50s and 60s. And that country they left at 16 to go to Oxford is a pariah state. You know, their their mobility is, is limited. So the backup plan is to really, that fire insurance married with that fire escape plan. So I was going to address another issue, which is 
how do I handle a situation where individuals who are foreigners with no mm -hmm. current plan to come to the U.S. wish to buy U.S. real estate? And the one piece of advice that I would give to uh, this group of people is never, ever take individual personal ownership mm -hmm. of U.S. rental real estate. The reason is that, as I like to say, you probably just put one foot into quicksand mm -hmm. and it's going to be exceedingly difficult to get you out of it other than an elaborate three to four year multi-step process because once you own U.S. real estate, any attempt to make a gift is subject to U.S. gift tax. And so therefore, the best piece of advice that I can give to any foreigner wishing to consider buying rental real estate is to talk to someone like myself before they acquire the property because there is an optimal ownership strategy. It's complicated. I'm working on this right now for an individual in Singapore who wants to buy residences in Palm Springs, California. And so what we have adopted is a two-tier multi-layered mm -hmm. LLC partnership arrangement in which the top tier will be a three-member Cayman LLC, limited liability company, for which we'll file what's called a reverse check the box election to treat it as a foreign partnership solely for U.S. tax purposes. It will still be an LLC in the Cayman with limited liability, but for the U.S. tax purposes, it will be a partnership. The next entity below that, the Cayman LLC, will own 99% of a two-person U.S. domestic LLC that by default, because it's organized in one of the 50 states, is a U.S. partnership because it has at least two owners. Now, the ultimate piece of real estate will be owned underneath that by a single member LLC so that if this particular individual wants to buy multiple different residences as rental property, any problems with one will not infect the other because they're each owned by a separate LLC. The reason partnerships work better is that you get complete pass-through of income tax. Unlike with corporations, you avoid the U.S. branch profits tax if you were to use a foreign corporation in the structure. And generally, if what you own at death is an ownership interest in a Cayman LLC that's prohibited from doing business in the U.S. and has no business in the U.S., arguably that should not be a U.S. situs asset when you pass away. So a whole bunch of reasons why this ownership structure is desirable. But again, it has to be set up before you move here. And then the funding of it, typically uh, the wealthy parent might make a loan to the bottom tier LLC. And we'd like to have that be eligible for what's called the portfolio interest exception meaning that the lender would not have U.S. source interest because of a very large exception called the portfolio interest exception. And for U.S. estate tax purposes, if what you own at death is this portfolio loan, that's exempt from U.S. estate tax. So all very complicated, but for someone like me, this is what I do every day. So don't take ownership in your personal name because there's going to be extreme difficulty mm -hmm. in unwinding that. Just wow. and, and on the, guys. Yeah. I was going to say, and we, we often, whether it's the, the Mexican clients looking for a backup plan, we have a, we have a group right now of South Africans and they'll say, okay, I want to go to the United States and get a green card. Well, the moment you get a green card, you are a U.S. person for tax purposes, mm -hmm. subject to U.S. worldwide taxation. So we really sit down and say, okay, well, what do you really want? Well, I want my kids to go to school or maybe to start their mm -hmm. career in the United States. Fine. We'll get them the green card and whatever is the most efficient and path and the best path for them with, with regards to timing. But the matriarch and patriarch saying, well, what we want to do is we want to invest in the mm -hmm. United States. So they use a structure like, like Mel was just describing. We want to be able to visit our children and maybe hopefully one day our grandchildren. And we want to be able to have what we think of as a safe haven should things deteriorate elsewhere. And so yeah. we say, okay, well, we can get you beyond being a mere visitor. We can get you the right to live for periods of time under non-immigrant statuses from intercorporate transfers or our very common one because these are business people. 
And so we create a, a, a U.S. subsidiary and we, we get that, which gives allows them to stay if they want to every day for two, for two years and renew, renew, renew. But they don't choose to stay too long so that mm-hmm. they trigger tax status from physical presence. So I like to say it's almost like Homeland Security says, come on in. And the IRS is behind them whispering, and we hope you stay too long. <laughs> so it's looking at that what each generation or each family member is trying to do. And to again, your backup plan deals with all the goals and timing and, and situation for, and you're, you want to do this multi-generationally, just like all of the, the Les Browns nieces and nephews not only got to tromp around Europe, as they start having their own children, they're passing on that ability to, to future generations. David and I have begun to work with a family from South Africa that's the second generation. The children are contemplating possibly moving to the United States. Mm-hmm. And the strategies involved with twofold, really, that I'll just mention that come to mind. Number one, generally, once you become a U.S. income tax resident, it's very difficult to avoid current U.S. Mm-hmm. income tax. And therefore, if you set up, we have a rule in our internal revenue code that if you set up a foreign trust and then you move to the U.S. within five years of funding that trust, that trust is automatically taxed on its global income by the U.S. It's a grant to a trust automatically. There are some ways to get around that, but it's primarily having to do with private placement variable life insurance because you put your investments inside an insurance wrapper. And as long as it qualifies as insurance, then the accretion in value is not subject to current U.S. income tax. That's complicated and not for most people. The primary strategy is that people who are moving to the U.S. or their children are moving to the U.S. would be, one, a drop-off trust. So we can avoid U.S. estate tax for someone who says, I'm coming to the U.S. temporarily. I don't know if I'm going to stay. And therefore, I want to make sure that even if I did decide to stay, that I don't have U.S. estate tax on my worldwide assets. And so therefore, we use what are called drop-off trusts. And drop-off trusts are effective to prevent U.S. estate tax. However, if most of the family members are in the United States, the general concept, the general rule of planning is U.S. trust for U.S. persons. So we want that drop-off trust to be a U.S. domestic trust so that I don't have what are called throwback tax problems for the future U.S. resident or U.S. citizen beneficiaries of the trust. Another strategy that I sometimes use is I take the example of Amazon stock Mm -hmm. that's owned by a foreigner coming to the United States. Unlike many countries that provide a fresh basis just upon entering that country, the United States does not have that. So if I own a lot of Amazon stock and I bought it at 20 and it's now at 100, I have to manufacture a way to get my basis up to 100 when I enter the U.S., Because if I don't, the U.S. is going to tax me on the entire gain Mm. from the date I first purchased it. So what I sometimes have done is I'll have a client put their Amazon stock or a portfolio of assets into a Cayman Mm -hmm. trust. And then we file a uh, check the box election to have a deemed liquidation of that corporation right before they move to the U.S. Well, that triggers basis step up so that let's say the basis is 100, Mm -hmm. which is the current fair market value at the point in time of entering the U.S. That means that the basis for gain or loss purposes in the U.S. will be 100 and it won't be 20. Mm -hmm. That's a good thing. But again, these things all take time. And you notice I said these things have to be done Mm -hmm. before you come into the U.S. It's too late once you're in the U.S., and too often I see situations of individuals whose families are from India or from other parts of the world, and their families just give them assets in their own name. Mm-hmm. Much better to have the parents and the patriarchs and matriarchs elsewhere in the world set up U.S. domestic trusts and put the property into business interests into 
a U.S. trust for the benefit of their U.S. citizen or resident heirs, because that way the property in the trust is not subject to U.S. estate tax when the foreign patriarch or matriarch dies, but as importantly, it's not subject to U.S. estate tax when the child dies. Or if it's a generation skipping trust, it's possible that there could never be a U.S. transfer tax. Mm -hmm. And most individuals don't realize that the U.S. transfer tax is a subjective determination based on domicile. Where are you domiciled? Mm -hmm. And the U.S. income tax is an objective test. How many days are you physically present in the U.S.? Do you or do you not have a green card? Very different tests. Mm -hmm. If I have a green card and I am physically present in the U.S., there's a presumption that I'm a U.S. domiciliary. On the other hand, if I have my green card and I'm domiciled in Canada or the U.K., the, I may be a U.S. income tax resident because I have a green card, but I can make a pretty good case for the fact that that same person is not a U.S. domicile for U.S. transfer tax purposes. Wow. We're almost at the end. You guys, I can see how passionate both of you are, what you do. I love it because I'm passionate what we do as well, uh, me and Mina. You know, how can our listeners find you? Mel, go ahead. So melvin.warshaw at gmail.com. No matter where I am, I return emails very quickly. That's great. How about you, David? Mine's a little more complex. It's at david at lesperanceassociates.com, or you can just uh, Google me. You'll see lots of articles and eventually find the website. Also, there will be emails there. There is a telephone number with a message service. It's actually a Bay Area number. I'm not trying to be an international man of mystery. It was just that we have so many Silicon mm -hmm. Valley clients. When Skype said, where do you want us? Give me a Bay Area number mm -hmm. and things. But we do answer it. And that's probably the best way of, of getting a hold. And if you can get a hold of either one of us, of course, we constantly are identifying new clients. And again, two of them, <laughs> Mel, are in your inbox over the last 24 hours of, oh, you need to talk to Mel about this piece of the uh, fire escape plan. That's great. Thank you again for coming here. And Mel, when you're going to be in Sarasota, please contact us. We would love to take you out to lunch, me and Mina and meet you in person. Thank you again. And I have a feeling we'll have you guys back because our listeners are probably going to have a million questions. So we'll bring you again. Thank you. Excellent. It's Thank you. Look forward to meeting you in person next January. Next January. <laughs>